one of the things you get asked when you're a forager is what are you going to do with them or how are you going to sort them out when you get home and, and, and how are you going to deal with a big basket full of mushrooms. And I thought I'd just talk a bit about that now because it's something that needs to demystify, it's something that I need to take the fear out of. Here we've got a big, big basket full of mixed rooms. This is the yield from a bit of a ride this morning. And the first thing you do when you get home after you've had a nice cup of tea is you go through and you make sure you've got nothing untoward and then you'll grade them and sort them into different piles for different uses. And I'll just go through what I've got. The other reason I'm doing this today is because I haven't got anything that a restaurateur would say, well, that's very high value. What I've got is a mishmash of lots of different species. It's a really typical find from just riding around in the suburbs. There's nothing that would cost you an arm and a leg down at Borough Market. In fact, most of these probably never be sold for sale. But they are nonetheless tasty and delicious and every bit as, as useful in your kitchen as some of the very, very exotic species. First things first, there might be some things I don't know. I might depict something and I might later think, what is it? I therefore have this handy, should I need it? Mushrooms, another fungi of Great Britain, Europe by Roger Phillips. This is the old edition, uh, as opposed to the newer one. I find this to be most useful, but you use whatever guidebooks you like. And keep it at hand for when you get home. Don't take it out in the field. That's probably missing the point if you do. First things first, we have parasols. Aren't they great? I talked about these in, a, in an earlier video. It's one of my favorite edible species. I could have had a basket full just of those, but I haven't. I've got enough for a meal's worth for the two of us, for myself and for Ellie. Um, they're delicious, they're tasty, very, very common. This and the other two species. I'm going to get the species named right in this video, like the last one. This is Macrolepiota procera. There's also Macrolepiota recodes, Macrolepiota hortensis. I actually found some hortensis today, but they were all wormy and nasty. These, as you can see from the fact that there aren't lots and lots of worm holes in the stem here, they're in pretty good condition. They're good fresh, they're good dried as well. What I'm going to do with those is I'm going to put them in a colander over there. Just out of my way. They don't have much dirt on them, they don't particularly brush clean. They're fine. I, I, I can... I can put those in the fridge as they are. Then I'm going to go into the main meat and drink of what's in this basket. Mmm, agaricus. Lots of species of agaricus you find. It doesn't really matter which you have, except if you've got some of the poisonous ones. And the poisonous ones that I sometimes find uh, are agaricus, well, we'll go for the common names, the, the yellow staining mushrooms or Agaricus xanthoderma if you really want. Uh, I've got a real mishmash of Agaricus here. We got somewhere in this basket I've got some field mushrooms, somewhere I've got horse mushrooms. So here we've got a little young horse mushroom which got rather badly mashed and eaten by a snail. Here we got probably Agaricus bernardi it was growing underneath some um, uh, pine trees. Then we got some, I'm going to call them wood mushrooms. Slightly shaggy on top, wonderful almondy flavour. Again, these are good fresh, they're good dried. Um, I've got a couple of partridges in the fridge, so I'm going to make a stew with partridges in those later. On top of the lower abundance ones I picked, Lutinium. Now these are normally labelled by the likes of Roger Phillips as not particularly good. I'm going to make the argument that they are very, very good indeed. Exactly which species, well, it's one of the brown latiniums, it's under birch, um, would normally be left by a lot of pickers. But when it's dried, when it's actually intensified the flavour and the drying process, it's every bit as good as the dried Belitus. Likewise, I have a few over here, <laughs> slippery back really earning their name today. Um, it's rained quite heavily and Slippery Jack it absorbs water like a sponge. Ordinarily I would always dry those before eating them because eating them fresh, they're, they're kind of gooey and slimy and not very exciting. I don't know, they're, they're so wet that drying them might be a fool's errand. So I'll have to decide what to do with them later. Another one, so what I'll do with those is I'm going to put the side on my board and they're going to be sliced up and dried. 
Another one I picked in Profusion, and the one which actually makes the bulk of the basket today, is the good old field bluet, La Pista Saiva. And this is one of my very, very favourite mushrooms. It is as common as muck. It's the starling of the mushroom world. You get it on the most cultivated ground. You get it on manky bits of council-operated grasslands. You get it in woods sometimes. You get it in the edge of farm fields. You get it under trees. Oh, it's a great mushroom. It's meaty and flavoursome. It's got that, what the Japanese refer to as umame flavour. It's got that sort of satisfying meaty flavour to it. And it's really easy to identify as well. To begin with, it's actually on the can. Yeah, this purpley stem. The brown gills, barely attaching to the stipe. It's got this buttery, soft brown cap. And when it breaks open, it's got a distinctive, ever so slightly floral smell to it. It's got a couple of cousins which you also find. There's um, the wood bluet, which is altogether more purple all the way through. Possibly even better flavour, but not as common. At least not as plentiful. Uh, and the pista agrina, which is sort of a... It looks sort of intermediate between the two, but I actually don't think it's as tasty as either. This, in my opinion, is the king of the winter mushrooms in Britain. You get lots and lots and lots of it. Traditionally, in these Midlands, you find it for sale in the greengrocers up there. I used to buy it in the, the greengrocers in Beeston sometimes. Uh, until I realised you could pick it very, very plentifully there. They cook it as if it's tripe, so they, they stew it down with milk and they thicken the sauce with flour and they serve it in a bed of mashed potato. Uh, I once got stopped by a policeman because I was standing in the corner of a field with a knife and he wanted to know what I was doing and as soon as he spotted I was picking what they referred to up there as blueies. He was delighted to let me go with a polite tap on the shoulder and a few mushrooms in his pocket, so he was quite happy. Uh, lastly, there's one other really interesting specimen in here so what's what else in here there's a lot more bluets and a, a lot more agaricus but i also have a good handful of these this is referred to these days is the ear fungus or the wood ear um, if you look in books even just as old as the 1990s you find it's referred to as jews ear which is now, of course, a rather politically incorrect name. Now, you might think that's because it's dark and it refers to the, the colour as if a Jewish person's a necessarily a darker Middle Eastern person. And, of course, this is nonsense. And common names in England don't refer to Jewish people in that way because Jewish people never look that way to the English. It refers to the fact that you traditionally find it growing on a... on a Well, it refers to two things. One is that it's traditionally found growing on, on, a, on an elder tree, which was believed to be the tree which Judas Iscariot hung himself from. Uh, the other thing is that through the Middle Ages you occasionally find mushrooms referred to as Jews meat because they've got that meaty sort of flavour and are quite filling and were always relatively cheap, which is a rather negative connotation uh, accusing Jews of being mean, which of course we all know is not true. So it's called Jews here or Wood here, it depends how old you are and whether you want to go with the old name or the, or the modern name. Uh, I don't think anyone's particularly offended by either. And it's very, very similar to the woodier mushroom that the Chinese uh, use in a lot of their cooking, which is often used almost like a garnish to add texture. And it dries wonderfully well. So that one is going to go over here with the Lachinium. That's going to go into my dryer, and I'm going to give that to a Chinese colleague of mine who's good enough to give me some woodiers that she brought back from China recently. So that's what I got today. Because uh, I didn't mention it, many of the blue it. Some of them are going to cook down and go into a uh, an egg and mushroom pie to go to a D&D game tomorrow with the boys. Uh, the rest of them are going to go into the freezer. Uh, the bluet fungus is found all the way through winter and it will freeze solid hard in the field and be absolutely fine. So it freezes brilliantly and it will store very, very well in that form. Far better than drying it. So I'm going to freeze some of those. I'm going to dry the chinium, possibly the sewerless, the slippery jack, certainly the ears. I might dry a few of the garicus if I've got more than I can use today and tomorrow. Uh, and I'm going to probably be eating mushrooms for two days. Ah, and one last surprise that I forgot to mention. They're very, very dirty. Giant puffball. I say it's a giant puffball, that is the species. You wouldn't know by looking at it. This was growing in a playing field and I just caught it out of the corner of my eyes I went past. It's horribly misshapen because it was pushing its way through the turfs of grass, which are normally very trampled down by children playing there. And I could have left it to grow a bit, but 
there's no chance it would have survived to a larger size. If I'd gone back later, it would have been kicked to nothing by the children who quite rightly would assume it was some kind of bull. It's misshapen and battered now because it was pushing its way through the grass, but it would probably have become far more spherical, far more like what you're expecting out of a puff bull as it grows. And it's really, really dirty, this one, because as I say, it was stuck in the grass. I'm going to give this one a wash and have a look, see what kind of nick it's in. But if it's good, then that's going to form probably dinner for Monday night when Ellie gets back from, from the holidays. Thank you very much. If you like this, if you don't know more about these, then leave me a comment and I'll answer your questions. Failing that, uh, if you think others might find this video interesting, please share the link with them. And I'll see you next time.